Good evening. My name is Susan Lamb, and I'm chair of the Community Liaison Committee for Vito Intervac. The committee was created by the University of Saskatchewan to serve as an independent organization working to ensure full and open communication on safety issues related to the International Vaccine Center. The committee is comprised of community leaders and some of your neighbors, and the committee's role is to provide information to the public regarding safety and security. As part of this work, we hold public meetings at least biannually to provide updates on the work of Vito Intervac and to answer any questions you might have. Besides myself, the committee has a, a group of, of very prominent Saskatoon people. There are Patricia Rowe, Noreen Jeffrey, Janice Hobbs, Morgan Hackle, Brian Gibbs, Dick Batten, Simon Cappage, Gabe LaFond, and Verity Moore Wright. And of course, our guest speaker tonight, Volker Gertz. Dr. Volker Gertz is the director and CEO of the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, International Vaccine Center. He serves as associate director of research here from 2007 to, two, to 2018. And he, he was also professor of veterinary immunology at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine. He received a DVM in 1994 and a PhD equivalent in 1997 from universities in Germany. He serves as on a number of experts committees, too many to list, but, he, but one of the most relevant today is he is a member of one of uh, four WHO expert groups relating to vaccine development. Dr. Gertz? Well, good evening, and uh, thank you very much, Susan, for the introduction. So I'm going to take my mask off now and uh, have to adjust my microphone there quickly. So just checking in, can people hear me okay now? Does this work? Good. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, unfortunately, this is not quite the format that we had hoped for, but it's the best we can do at the moment. And so what Susan and I wanted to do tonight is tell you what's um, tell you about all the exciting stuff that's happening here at Vito Intervac. So we'll have a little bit of a slight presentation for you and hopefully you can uh, enjoy that from home. And then at the end, there's also some time for addressing some of the questions that um, you have asked and hopefully we can have a, an interesting Q&A session afterwards. So Vito Intervac is a research center here at the University of Saskatchewan. We just had our 45th birthday just in September of this year. Um, we have about 150 staff members here and an annual budget of more than $20 million. And uh, most importantly, we operate some of the most advanced containment infrastructure in Canada. And this is really where all the COVID work is happening at the moment. And so what you see here on this slide is um, what we call the Intervac facility. Susan had uh, referred to it. So you can see there is two uh, sides of a building or two wings uh, of a building there. So in the glass building is really where all the laboratories are. There are six uh, laboratories that allow us to work with um, these dangerous pathogens, including viruses and bacteria. And then on the left side, you see in gray, that's really the animal wing. That's where, we're, where uh, most of the animal studies take place. And it makes this facility one of the largest and most advanced facilities in the world. We can house there more than 1,000 pigs under what is called level 3 conditions. And so there is four levels to pathogens, with level 4 being the highest, the Ebola virus, for example. And so this facility is designed for work on level 3 pathogens, and COVID-19 is one of those examples. It allows us to work with animals, and that's critical when you develop a vaccine. It's a part that none of us really likes, but it's absolutely critical if you wanted to assess any new vaccines, any new therapeutics, or any new antivirals. And this facility actually allows us to house anything from bats to very large animals, including bison. And so if you fly over, you see it there. It's uh, essentially the size of a football field. It's a very large facility, and it's connected to our Vito building, which is on the right there, um, with this overpass connecting the two. And if you would walk into the building and see what's happening in the lab, you can see how our staff now works with these dangerous pathogens. They're wearing PPE. They're wearing these, um, these um, protective units over their head, which have filtered um, or a small filter in the back of, of um, the individual carrying them around and it provides filtered air that is blowing away from the face. However, you can see we're using what is um, called a biosafety hood 
Um, so on the left side there, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but on the left side there is where we, we work with these pathogens. And so in these biosafety cabinets here is really where we work with them and it provides an extra level of protection. So very, very unique in the way how we can work with these pathogens and the barrier of, or the safety it provides for our staff working with them. This is now a view of some of the inner facility parts, um, so where we work with the animals, and you can see we call this a clean corridor here. Um, to the right behind these steel doors is where the animals are in these rooms there. And to get into one of these animal rooms, you have to essentially shower in and shower out and then be able to work with them. Um, you have to wear this PPE that you just saw on this slide before. And here is how these rooms then look on the inside. Um, they're designed in a way that we can house anything, as I mentioned, from very small animals, as you can see in this picture here, for example, now, where we're housing cages that have mice or potentially hamsters or ferrets in them, to very large uh, animals, like shown here, cattle, for example. And here now we would have a setup as a, with a gating system that allows our cattle to, um, to be in there. And as you can see on the next slide, Right now, actually, in the facility, we have bison. Uh, we're working on a vaccine for tuberculosis, so not all of our research at the moment is looking at COVID-19. And you can see this facility enables us to even house bison um, that were just um, brought in, and they're undergoing now a vaccine study. On the right side there, you can see then there is one of our smallest tenants. So this is a bat here. Um, and, and you can see we house them in these um, tents. They're allowing them to fly around and so on. And then during the day, sit in these um, uh, sleeping chambers, if you want, where they, where they can rest. So Vito Intervac is really doing research on inf infectious diseases that are affecting both animals and humans. And it's of particular interest to us um, to look at emerging diseases, zoonotic infections that jump from animals to humans or also from humans to animals, and uh, that potentially threaten not only human health, but also that of our livestock and that, of course, of our food security. So emerging diseases, zoonotic infections, one of the future or really one of the current and future emphasis of this organization, and that's where more of most of our work is currently taking place. So when COVID-19 came around in January, we already started to design a vaccine on the afternoon when the sequence of the virus was first published. So what that means is when, when the Chinese colleagues released the genetic code of this virus that same afternoon, we met here, we designed the virus and started our vaccine work for it. Um, we also had at that time reached out to the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg. Uh, the director at the time, Matt Gilmer, and said, uh, Matt, if there is anything that Vito can do in helping you with this disease, we're here for you. And since then, we've been working very close with the animal in Winnipeg and various other organizations and groups in Canada as well. Vito Entevac was the first in Canada to isolate the virus. This was done in collaboration with Sunnybrook in Toronto and then the Winnipeg lab, the National Microbiology Lab. A sample was um, obtained in Ontario from one of their first cases and then sent out here. And it was our researchers here at Vito Intervac who were able to isolate the virus and then provide it back to the public health lab, provide it back to the Winnipeg facility, provide it back to the provincial laboratories for their diagnostic um, efforts and so on. Um, so, so very, very important for the country overall. Once we had the virus, it also allowed us to do develop an animal model right away. And so we chose ferrets at the time because ferrets were one of the, the species that were suspected to be a good animal model for this disease. And so ferrets was the first one that we developed and shortly after then uh, we developed also a hamster model. And we were the first in Canada to have a vaccine underway. And I'm gonna show you in this presentation a few slides on, on how the vaccine actually works in these animal models and where we are with it and how we are going um, soon, hopefully, into clinical trials. Now, while we're doing all of this work, I think the most important aspect, though, is that Vito Intervac has really become a go-to place in Canada for COVID-19 research. We're doing now contract work with more than 70 organizations, testing their vaccine candidates, testing their antivirals and their therapeutics, and about half of them are Canadian companies and the other half are international companies or international organizations. And we're very f we are very fortunate that we have a very um, 
you know, flexible workforce, um, an, an excellent group of people in that in, in work in the lab and also work with the animals and so on. And it didn't take us very long, as you can see on the slide, to put together a very large team of individuals who are now doing the COVID-19 work. We have more than th 30 people involved in the research, all the way from people in the lab to people organizing the contracts, people organizing the animal trials to biosafety to operations of the facility and even administration and so on. So large efforts are going now into our COVID-19 research. And again, um, most of that is actually right now focused on helping others in testing their approaches as well. Um, we are also fortunate to have um, several collaborators, not only internationally and nationally in Canada, uh, most of the, or the, the bigger organizations in Canada we're working with internationally, we're working with other countries, including the US, France, and others, um, but also locally, and this is important to mention, there is various individuals here on campus who are working with very closely, um, both over at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, but also at the College of Medicine and Dentistry. And as you can see on the right side, we were even able to attract um, some professors from other universities to come here for a year to be seconded to Vito Intervac. Um, Dr. Allison Kelvin from Dalhousie University and Dr. Jason Kindrachuk are both here now spending the next year with us, helping us in, in working on this COVID-19 uh, research questions. And so as I mentioned, Vito Intervac has become the go-to place in Canada for COVID-19 work. Um, many, many contracts underway, as I mentioned, about half of them are Canadian. The other half are international contracts, including big organizations, for example, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or some of those vaccine manufacturers that you have seen in the news who have now leading vaccine candida candidates under development. And much of this work is really possible um, because of the funding from the government of Canada and also the government of Saskatchewan. So it's very important to acknowledge their, their foresight and their, their support for all this work that is happening. So let me tell you a little bit about the work we do here and, and, and hopefully I can tell you or, or show you that it's very, very exciting the stuff that's happening here right now. So to start, uh, COVID-19 is caused by a virus and so of course everybody right now because of um, all the media and news and so on, everybody knows what a virus is. But, but here you can see actually on this slide that these viruses are really, really small. So you can see there on the left side, um, viruses are typically less than half a micron in size. Well, what does that mean? It means that on the rim of a coin, you can put about 10,000 viruses in a row. That's how small these things are, and that's why they're so easily transmitted via aerosols. So when we speak, for example, like not right, right now, droplets and so on. So they're very, very small. They can easily be transmitted, easily be shed. They, they are being shed with body fluids and they also um, can be found on surfaces, which is why we are all taking these precautions of wiping surfaces and so on. Now, when they are being transmitted, we breathe them in. And that's the problem with COVID-19. So you can see there the sketch on the left side, so the airways of a human. And then what we're seeing on the right side there are these individual cells, we call them epithelial cells, that are lining the mucosal surfaces and the respiratory tract. And there is really one layer of cells between the outside of the body, if you want, the air, the environment, and the inside of the body, the tissue that you can see there on the left side underneath it. And so what these viruses do is they attach to the cell surface, which is shown here on the left side, if you look at this picture. So in yellow and green are all these viruses, and you can see in gray here, these are the individual cells that are um, found in, our, in lining our mucosa surfaces. And so these viruses now are trying to get into the cell because they need to replicate, which means make more of themselves in the cell. And they do it, as you can see in the sketch on the right side, by attaching to the cell surface, attaching to molecules on the cell surfaces, and we call those molecules receptors for the virus. And so what these viruses do then once they attach to the cell surface, they use the cell machinery, as you can see further down, to make eventually many, many copies of themselves, which then can be shed into the environment. 
So while there is a few of them getting in, there is many, many of them coming out, and that's one of these problems why we, why certain diseases, viral diseases, are so easily transmissible, um, because we're producing so many copies of this virus, which then can be shared around. And so the strategies for all of us to prevent this through vaccines or other therapeutics is to try to block the attachment of the virus to the cell surface. And that is shown there, and antibodies, and you all see this in the news all the time, antibodies are the molecules that are trying to or attempting to block the attachment of the virus to the cell surface. And that's what we call neutralizing antibodies, and that is one of the most important readouts for the COVID-19 vaccine. How effectively does the vaccine induce antibodies, and how long do, does the antibody response last? Now, the other important mechanism that the immune system has is to um, use T cells to now destroy infected cells. And so for effective vaccines, we want both the induction of antibodies as well as what we call a cell-mediated immune response that can take care of these infected cells. Now, how does that work? How do we make such a vaccine? Well, here's a scheme of the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19. And you can see in yellow are these molecules on the cell surface, and that's what the virus uses to attach to these receptors on the cell surface. And so, of course, we want to try with our vaccine to block these structures as much as possible so that we can prevent the adherence of the cells to the cell surface. And there is various technologies in development right now. Some are developing what is called an inactivitis, inactivated virus, so using the whole virus as a vaccine, while others are just using parts of the virus, subunits of the virus, um, for their vaccine. And these subunits can be encoded by just um, parts of the genetic material. The Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccines are example of those. They're using a piece of the genetic material of the virus, encoding for that one particular yellow structure, the spike protein that attaches to the cell surface. While others, like in us for example, use the subprotein directly, the subunit protein directly, um, so we're not using the genetic material, but we're using the protein in our vaccine. And others then are using what is called a vector. And so instead of just injecting the genetic material directly, they're using another harmless virus, a adenovirus, for example, that then has, um, through a genetic modification of the virus, expresses now the yellow structure, the spike protein on its surface, and so now you have a adenovirus that carries a part of the COVID-19 virus on it, the SARS-CoV-2 virus on it, and so therefore delivers now the information to the immune system that this is what we need to make an immune response to. So these are the various technologies that are going forward, and for each of those there is now um, vaccines in phase two and phase three trials. Um, here at Vito Intervac, as I mentioned, we're working on these subunit vaccines. So we're, we're focusing on using the protein, the yellow protein, as our vaccine, and then we use an adjuvant to make the immune response to it stronger, and thereby I'm um, hoping to get good protection. And the advantage of that is that subunit vaccines are a proven technology. They have been in humans for many, many other vaccines, including, um, for example, pertussis, tetanus, diphtheria, um, and hepatitis, many, many examples that are based on these subunit vaccines. And the other important feature is that they're easy to manufacture. You can make millions of doses of these vaccines very easily. They don't require a complicated um, cold chain. They don't require minus 80 temperatures to store them and so on. So they're fairly easy, um, cost effective to make, and also have an excellent safety profile. And so that's what we are using right now, and that's what we are focused on. Now, in terms of how we're making a vaccine in general, um, there is here shown the, the various stages that are involved in, in vaccine development, and you can see normally this would take 10 to 15 years to make a vaccine. Um, there is the first phase, the research phase, and we call it the preclinical phase here, the discovery side. And this is what, what Vito is normally all about. This is where you develop new vaccines, you test them out in animal models, you optimize them, you further develop them, and so on. 
And then eventually, once you have a candidate that in animal studies has shown that it works, so efficacy is, is demonstrated, uh, then you have to demonstrate that it's safe in animals first. And once that is done, then it can go into human clinical trials. And so you can see there the, the arrow here, what you need to have from moving from preclinical studies and human studies is that you have to have what we call GMP material material that is clinical grade material that is manufactured in facilities that are very, very sterile, very clean inside, so free of any contamination. And this material then can be used in human clinical trials. And once we enter those human clinical trials, the normal way of doing this is that there is a phase one trial, which is just focused on the safety of the vaccine. There is a phase two trial, which is then addressing also, in addition of safety, also looking at the immune response. And then in phase three, we have uh, thousands of volunteers, tens of thousands of volunteers, and now we're asking the question, does the vaccine work or not? Once that is all approved, or um, um, gone positive, the data is being reviewed, and then you get approval to start a manufacturing vaccine. And you can see in Canada, it's Health Canada who does this review. In the US, it's the FDA. And then you're allowed to commercially start manufacturing your vaccine. Now, with this current COVID-19 outbreak, these 10 to 15 years are now shrinking into one to two years. And so that is possible because now, instead of doing these activities sequentially, we're trying to do as many of these activities in parallel already without compromising the safety of it. And so you can see now down here globally, um, there is various vaccines that are already in, in phase two and phase three trials. In Canada, you have the leading two, which is Medicargo and then the Vito Intervac vaccine. And we are now about to start our phase one trials and Medicargo is currently in phase one trials already. So where are we with ours? Let's just show you some of the results here. So we're currently um, entering or we, we're clearing the last hurdle if you want. Um, we're just finishing our toxicology studies. So this is now demonstrating that in animals, the vaccine is completely safe. And then uh, we're meeting with the health regulators um, in, in uh, actually November 23rd and hoping to get them permission to start our uh, clinical trials in December, starting with our phase one trials then. And so here is just a few data um, slides to show you how the vaccine works and how it performs. So this is focused on testing the vaccine in ferrets and hamsters. And you, and you can see here ferrets, um, they're, they're a good model and, and they're allowing us to assess how well the vaccine or, um, protects um, from viral replication. So how, how much of the virus is being controlled in the upper respiratory tract. And then the hamster model is really helping us to assess how well does the vaccine protect from clinical disease. It shows a little bit more clinical disease than the ferret model. And so these are some of the animal models that are being uh, used around the world right now. So ferrets and hamsters are the most common models. People are using also mice, and they call these ACE2 mice that have the human receptor for the virus. And then um, vaccines also have to be evaluated in non-human primates. And you can see there is rhesus macaques and, and cynos and African greens um, that are used for the, cu the current um, COVID-19 research. So here's an example of our vaccine, and without really going in great detail, there's really three questions that I wanted to show you in, in based on what I showed in my introduction. So the first question is, does our vaccine induce these neutralizing antibodies that I had shown you before that are critical in blocking the virus from adhering to the receptor? And the answer is yes. You can see there on the left side, we're measuring these neutralizing antibodies in, in assays in the lab. And you can see here are two vaccine candidates that we developed here and the red and the blue, and both are inducing very high levels of these neutralizing antibodies. So yes, our vaccine is very effective in, in inducing those. Does it protect against clinical disease? So here is um, a data slide from hamsters, and it shows you that in purple there on the bottom, that's the control group, so non-vaccinated animals. And we're measuring here how much weight these animals are losing after the infection as a readout of how severe the disease is in these animals. And you can see um, in purple there, um, some of these animals are losing up to 15% of their weight, which is quite significant. Whereas in red, as you can see, the vaccinated animals are not losing any weight at all. So they're protected um, from the clinical disease. 
Um, so the vaccine helps them to, to deal with the disease. And then lastly, how well do, can we control the virus in the upper respiratory tract, which as I mentioned is relevant to how we're shedding, how we're transmitting it to other people. And again, without going in, in great detail here, you can just see on the left side there, in red are these vaccinated animals and in black are the control animals. And what we're measuring here is how much virus is actually in the upper respiratory tract, so in the nasal washes of these animals. And you can see in red that most of the animals in this vaccines are, are uh, in the vaccine group here are below any detectable levels, meaning there is no replication of the virus occurring in the upper respiratory tract. Um, so we're controlling it quite well, um, which is really, really good for demonstrating how well this vaccine works. Here are the timelines where we are, as I mentioned. So we're currently in our safety and talk studies. We're about to enter, hopefully, our phase one, phase two trials. We're scheduled to start those in December. And in parallel, we, we will be doing NHP studies, so testing our vaccine in African green monkeys. And these studies will be done in Winnipeg um, to demonstrate that the vaccine works in, in non-human primates. Now, COVID-19 is just one example of these emerging diseases. And there's many, many others around. And so one of the things that we're doing here right now at the same time is building a manufacturing facility. And you may have seen in the news, Canada is really lacking in its capacity on developing or manufacturing vaccines. Manufacturing capacity um, outside of the large companies is very, very sparse in, in Canada at the moment. And so both Vito Intervac as well as the NRC in Ottawa are currently developing um, vaccine manufacturing facilities. And you can see we'll go into the Intervac facility, we'll go up here into the third level of the facility and we'll take over part of the second uh, level as well. And so what we will do there is build something that may look like this. So these days vaccine manufacturing will be uh, or is all based on what is called single use. Um, equipment. So you essentially produce one vaccine in these plastic reactors, as you can see there. So it's all metal, but inside they're all lined with these large plastic bags that are full with uh, media that the cells need to optimally grow and so on. Um, and then once you're done with that run, you throw it out and you can start a new run there, thereby um, reducing the chance for any contamination or any of that. And so you can see this is what we're currently establishing at Vito. Um, a facility that will have equipment like this inside um, so that we can make then vaccines both for humans and animals here at Vito Intervac and uh, will overcome some of the shortages that Canada has right now in terms of not only manufacturing these vaccines but also manufacturing clinical grade material for these um, clinical trials. So the, the construct and the manufacturing facility is currently being constructed. Construction has started of it. We hope to have it completed by about this time next year and then start our first production runs in early 2022. Now, the other thing I wanted to tell you about is the exciting research that we're doing to really look into the future. And so COVID-19 is teaching us that, that even if we shrink vaccine development from traditional 10 to 15 years down to one to two years, we're still lacking behind. We're still losing people every day. There's, there's thousands of people that have died from this disease, but economically we have now lost more in trillions in, in, um, in economic losses around the world, and there is no um, end in sight right now. So really, even bringing 10 to 15 years to down to one to two years is still not really helping us to, to, um, to avoid all of that. And so what we are working on right now at Vito Intervac is trying to develop vaccines for pathogens before we even know what they may be. Before a disease emerges, we want to have a vaccine for whatever that is ready, have it already stockpiled somewhere so that when a new vaccine or a new disease emerges, sorry, when a new disease emerges, you would have a vaccine ready potentially in an airplane within six hours and on its way to Wuhan or wherever it originated and start distributing 10 million doses of a vaccine. And even if such vaccine is not 100% or 90% effective, maybe only 75% effective, it still will help you to contain the spread as much as possible. Now, how is that possible? So here you can see traditionally it takes, as I mentioned, 10 to 15 years to develop such vaccines. Even if you shrink it down into one to two years, you're still 
trying to catch up with the disease, you're still facing um, trillions of, of dollars in economic losses and thousands of individuals that um, die from the disease. What we are saying is, as I mentioned, we would be trying to develop vaccines that are available and made and developed before a new disease breaks out. And so this is possible through advancement in now structural virology. We're, st we've, we're starting to understand better how these viruses are interacting with the cell system, what receptors they're using and so on, so how they actually look. And then also with um, bioinformatics and artificial intelligence, we can now start to predict what the next virus or the next pathogen may look like in the future where these mutations may occur and what regions of the virus and how it would affect how the virus then interacts with the cell surface and so on. And so you can see what in order to do this, you have to have facilities like Vito Intervac where you can do this in the lab, where you can essentially simulate in the lab what might happen in nature by itself. And so you have to be, have the ability to work with these different animal species and then force these viruses to jump these species barriers as they did for COVID-19. And then we can study where these mutations will happen. And then once these new diseases um, emerge, we can start making vaccines for them so that we're prepared for the next one rather than trying to catch up with it. And so that's really where we are going with our research here right now. That's um, where how our vision is, is going to be for the future. We're, we're aggressively trying to recruit some of the world's best scientists now to come to Vito Intervac and help us make this vision reality. And so in, in, in my last slide, I'd just like to thank you for your attention, but also like to thank all the supporters of our organization, so the government of Canada, the government of Saskatchewan, but then also some of the funders like CHR and private funders who have now um, supported much of the exciting work that's happening here at Vito Intervac. So thank you very much for, for that. We, we're going to move over now to our Q&A session. Um, we have already received some of the questions from you prior to um, this presentation, and we'll try to go through them and, and try to address them as much as possible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Volker. And while Volker is getting set up back in the easy chair, um, we, we've got a lot of really good questions, some of them very highly scientific and some of them from um, community people. But we were able to put them together. We put so several of them together. So you may not see your exact question, but it will have a, a version thereof. And so, Volker, one of the key things that people seem to be interested in is safety. Do you have any concerns about the safety of um, any of the vaccines for ordinary people and for those with underlying health? And, and related to that, there's a thing called ADE, antibody dependent enhancement. If you could touch on that too. That's one of the scientific questions. So I think it's important um, to, to um, make clear to people that um, all vaccines in their development right now are going through the same phases, through the same testing as they normally would go. We're just trying to make things faster, do them in a faster way. So rather than one completed, start the next one. We're trying to overlap our studies as much as possible right now, trying to save time. But the actual um, assessment of the safety is the same process. It's as rigorous as it normally is. And so therefore, um, I'm not concerned about the safety of these vaccines. Um, the second question, people with underlying conditions, I think are advised to talk to the doctor. Um, and it's hard to say what exactly it is, but you know, you always want to have those, um, in those cases, um, consultation with your doctors. Some of these technologies slightly vary. So we, as I mentioned, we have life vectors like the adenovirus vaccine, for example. Um, maybe if you have some chronic conditions, you don't want to use that one. So those um, discussions, I think, are you need to have with your doctor to, to um, you know, properly address what your unique situation is. And then for the ADE, so that was one of the concerns initially that we thought that with this coronavirus vaccine, um, there may be the potential of enhancing disease later on. And so far, we have not seen any evidence in any of the studies in either animals or humans so far that, that indicate that there would be such a risk. Okay. 
Well, one of the related to that concerns is uh, particularly with uh, um, some of these very new vaccines that I understand have never been tried in humans before, the messenger RMA and I, perhaps the, uh, the um, vectored vaccines too. Uh, can you address that? Yeah, so the vectored vaccines have been tested for other candidate vaccines before. So, you know, there, there is some um, vectored vaccines for malaria, for TB, um, for yellow fever, for, for others, for HIV even. Um, so they have gone through many, many humans before in these clinical trials. And so there we have enough safety information to clearly say that um, they are uh, safe to use. For the RNA vaccines, there is a little bit less data, but even there it has gone through in, at the NIH for other applications um, through clinical trials. And so, again, the safety profile of those is, is quite good. Okay. So um, the other thing is uh, the, a lot of questions about potential for human trials, particularly the one here in Saskatoon. Um, where, where can we sign up and when do we do it? <laughs> Lots of people want to volunteer, which I think is great. Yeah, so it's amazing to see the support from the community. Um, you know, in, since May, we have had um, volunteers from all over the country, from Halifax all the way to, to Vancouver, volunteering to be part of our vaccine studies. Um, so we will be doing our first phase one trial in Halifax at the Canadian Center for Vaccinology. Um, they're really one of the best sites in the country for this kind of work. Um, but then as we do enroll more and more individuals, we will be using various sites in the country for these clinical trials and currently assessing uh, whether we can um, use the site here in Saskatoon as well. So there may be actually the chance for volunteers in Saskatoon to be part of these trials. So who do they phone or who do they contact? Or um, phone me in three months. Okay, phone you in three months. We'll, yeah. we'll take you up on that. Okay, and you may have answered some of this uh, already in your talk, but uh, again, people are very interested in the timeline. Uh, your vaccine, but others. Yeah, so like, as I mentioned, um, like the, some of the international front runners, I mean, we, we can see it in the news. Um, there is um, five candidates now that are in phase three trials. And I think it's um, like fair to assume, and as you know, Canada has secured doses of them. Um, those will become available to targeted population probably within the next few weeks already under what is called an emergency authorization. Um, probably will start in the U.S. first and then I, I don't know how quickly we may see those vaccines in Canada. Um, my prediction would be that for Canadians, for the general public, we will see vaccines for COVID-19 become available um, late spring, early summer, somewhere there. For our own vaccine, we're slightly behind some of those, so we're looking more at fall of next year. Okay. Um, uh, you may have uh, covered this a bit, but talk a little bit about collaboration. Like, usually scientists um, are fairly competitive, and yet my sense with these, this vaccine development that that's quite different, and I know you already serve on an international committee that talks about what you're doing. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so I think on a global level, we see um, a level of collaboration that we have hardly seen before. Um, you know, the, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has organized these um, four vaccine expert group meetings. So there is one on vaccine development, one on animal models, one on reagents, and one on coordination of, um, of uh, clinical trials and, and serological studies. And so these expert groups um, meet every week in, in the morning, and so, you know, one group meets on Tuesday, the next one on Wednesday, and so on. And um, data is openly shared. Um, we, we, everybody has signed a confidentiality agreement, but people are openly discussing the newest findings they have, instead of you know first publishing and all and so on. And that's a level of collaboration that I've I've uh, rarely experienced before. So it's it's great to see right now how you know one center in the world does something, and and immediately within the week turnaround time, the data becomes available to everybody else in the world. And so that's, that's quite amazing. So um, you talked about this a bit, but uh, some of these vaccines have particular challenges. I, you know, certainly the kind that we're working on here, I think we, we know very specifically what some of the issues are, but some of the newer ones have even more difficult challenges with temperature and ability to replicate. Can you talk a bit about that? 
Yeah, so when, when we talk about these vaccines, I try to explain it. They all are slightly different, and that's a good thing. It's actually a good thing that we have different technologies going forward. Some will work out better than others. Some will be easier um, usable. Um, so, so for example, these vectored vaccines require um, storage at minus 80, um, which is, you know, you have to have minus 80 freezers for it. So not everybody has that. They're difficult to use in some parts of the world. Um, these RNA vaccines are very easy to make, uh, cost effective. But as you pointed out, they have never been in humans before. So we don't know how well they work. And then we have these subunit protein vaccines that we and, and others like Medicargo or Novavax produce. And they have the advantage that they are a proven technology. Um, they have an excellent safety profile, but they're a little bit longer to develop than some of these others. And that's why, for example, the Vito vaccine is slightly behind right now, some of the others. Um, but, you know, we're very optimistic that we will catch up. And, and I would actually predict that our vaccine is, is better than some of those yeah. others. Okay. <laughs> so um, I know you, we have a l number of contracts here on uh, also on treatments. And I know you can't talk about anything specific, but can you talk in general about some of the promising treatments out there for COVID? Yeah, so I think in, in general terms, um, vaccines are obviously one, one, one good um, strategy, but then there is uh, therapeutics, so using uh, monoclonal antibodies, and we all know President Trump got treated with those. It's an exp experimental um, uh, therapy there. So monoclonal antibodies are one, one good um, um, treatment option right now. And then there are some very interesting drugs, antivirals, that are in development, and they look very promising in animal models too. Okay, and, and uh, uh, was it fair to say we're working on some of them here yes. or testing them for yes. others? So we have a very large contract, for example, with the Gates Foundation to test uh, 25 of those compounds um, in the hamster model. Okay, maybe this is not a question somebody submitted. Perhaps I'll just say I'm submitting it. I have heard that Gates is developing his own vaccine and what does he know about vaccines? And that he's using vaccines to inject everybody with uh, microchips so they'll be able to keep track of you. Mm. Could you please address that? What I please? So, so I think it's, um, I don't know how to address that. <laughs> So the Gates Foundation is currently supporting um, several of those um, technologies that I showed in my presentation. They're building manufacturing facilities <laughs> for those companies. Um, so they're putting literally hundreds of millions of dollars into the development of vaccines. At the same time, they're looking at antivirals as, an, as an, a complement strategy to it. Um, so large amounts of money that the foundation is donating towards finding solutions for COVID-19 and and I think um, I'll leave it there. They don't own a patent, though, on any vaccine. No. That's the other thing. No, so they're supporting what other people are doing, and um, they're building even the infrastructure for it. And um, they're, they're very much in, in support of finding solutions um, to this disease. Okay, thank you. So another question then, uh, virus mutations. It seems like viruses are mutating. I think we just had a conversation recently about uh, a mutated virus in uh, Denmark in mink. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Does this virus mutate quickly? So all viruses mutate, but there some mutate faster and some mutate uh, less frequent. And so um, influenza viruses, for example, uh, very frequently mutate, whereas coronaviruses don't mutate as often as influenza viruses do. Um, so far in humans, we have not seen any new mutants that wouldn't be covered by any of the vaccines that are in development. As you pointed out, there is now some concerns in Denmark in, in mink populations there that got infected with the virus, and there it seemed like a new mutant had emerged from it. Um, so these events happen, but so far it looks like all the vaccines would still cover them. Okay. Um, somebody had a question about, um, is there anything you're missing? They specifically asked about uh, key ingredients, but it may be more than that. Is there anything you need to help develop that you're missing to develop this vaccine quicker? So it's quite amazing. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a global shortage of glass vials. There's a global shortage of needles. There's a global shortage of some of the material that you need to, to feed your cells. Um, 
it's getting better, but, but you could see that immediately everybody was planning ahead and what do we need for our clinical trials in a year from now? And everybody was just buying s stuff up and, and stockpiling it. And, and so um, there is shortages for some of this stuff, but it's uh, getting better now. We've been able so far to, to do all the things as we wanted in time, so, so that's good. But initially in May and June, we were slightly delayed because some of the raw material was not available, not to us, but uh, to the contractors that we had hired to make the material for us, and they couldn't purchase it themselves. So there was initially some slight delays, but now it's, it's um, much better. Okay. Um, just as an aside to that, I think Vito Intervac did some interesting things when there was a shortage of um, personal protective equipment, particularly the N95 mask. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, so mm -hmm. in the beginning, when we didn't know how bad this would be, um, hospitals were really worried about the, their capacity and, and also the, um, the PPE equipment that they had available to them. And so um, we, we uh, offered to use what we call um, a VHP decontamination. So that's uh, v VHP stands for vaporous hydrogen peroxide and that's a, that's a method of how we decontaminate our rooms in, in, in this facility that I showed you, the Intervac facility and equipment in it. And so it's um, it essentially a gas that works on, on this material and you let it uh, work on it for, for a few hours and then it effectively kills everything. And so we worked with the SHA, with the health authority on um, finding a way of um, decontaminating masks, PPE masks. And so these masks are now being collected in the ORs and the hospitals. They're being shipped over here and then um, Actually, some of our students have volunteered to hang mm. these masks <laughs> up in these rooms and then they're being decontaminated with the VHP and they're then being packed up again and shipped back to the hospitals. And we know they're safe, they, you've tested yeah, them. Yeah, so this is a process that, that um, was followed then by many other places in, in Canada. So Vito Intervac was one of the first in the country to establish the process. It got mm. approved by Health Canada. And uh, now there's various other places in Canada that are using a similar process. Okay, then somebody else had a question about the long-term effectiveness of the vaccine. Is there any sense of how long these things are gonna last? Are we gonna need one like a flu shot every year? Um, I don't know if it's gonna be every year, but probably every few years. Um, we're doing currently studies, um, so we have a long-term study going on. We're looking at one year right now. Um, so this is being done in animals and we vaccinate them and then three months, six months, nine months and 12 months after the first immunization, we expose these animals to the virus to see if they're protected or not. And, and these studies are underway so far. Uh, we're out, I think, into four months now and it's looking very good, but we don't know how long it actually lasts. Okay. And what does this work mean for the university and the community? How does that, how does that fit in? Well, I think it really um, shows the impact, um, both the university as well as Vito Intermac, that we can have for the country. Um, as I mentioned, we, we really have become one of the go-to places in Canada now for COVID-19 research. And, um, um, you know, it, like it's, it's hugely important, I think, for the university to be part of the effort um, finding a solution for Canadians. Okay. And here's a, a very interesting question. Um, how come we can get a vaccine for COVID-19, but we didn't get one for SARS? Uh, so we could have had a vaccine for SARS-1-2. I think what happened there is the disease ran out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, like, and initially it looked very, very, uh, um, you know, threatening. And so nobody knew how, how big it would get. And so very much like this, quickly people were trying to develop vaccine candidates and then as it turned out the vac and the disease ran out and so there was really no need for for developing vaccines and investing hundreds of millions of dollars into it or billions of dollars as we see now and so it was an, an economic decision not to pursue it you couldn't have tested it anyway because there'd be nobody to catch it to that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so um, a physician sent in a question um, why did you decide to take the protein subunit route in developing the vaccine? You talked about that briefly, but maybe just if you could elaborate on that. So subunit technologies are really one, one of those technologies that uh, here at Vito Intervac we do a lot of research on um, subunits and then also adjuvants. So that's one of our 
areas of strength if you want, um, co-formulating and finding very effective vaccines. Subunits in general, as I mentioned, have the advantage of that they can be manufactured very easily. They're easy to store. They're usually very cost effective, which is very important for animals, like for all of our animal vaccines. I mean, for chicken, the vaccine has to be cents per dose. Otherwise, nobody's going to use it. So you have to use technologies that are, that are cost effective. And so the same goes for humans. Um, so that's really why we, over the years, have focused on our subunit vaccine technologies. Okay. Um, another question then about the possible side effects of the vaccine. So from what we've seen so far with our vaccine, in animals at least, we have not noticed any unwanted reaction, any adverse events to it. Um, as I mentioned, we're currently in these talk studies right now. So what, what we do there is we... Um, and it's not us, it's um, certified organizations who are doing this kind of work, but the vaccine is being used in animals and uh, they get more immunizations even than humans would get with our vaccine. And then experts are looking at any adverse reactions in any of these tissues of these animals, whether there's anything that would indicate that there is any adverse reactions to the vaccine. And, and so far we haven't seen any. Okay. Um, so there was a good question here and I'm just missing it now. Um, if um, like someone wondered if they got the vaccine, then would they have to isolate afterwards? Was that something if you got the, the shot, if you'd have to go home and sit for two weeks? Yeah, not with our subunit vaccine. So again, we're using just a, a part of the vaccine, uh, of the virus. So the actual protein and that itself is not infectious, so you cannot transmit this to anybody else. Okay. So you don't have to self-isolate, in fact, with any of these vaccines that are currently under development. Okay. Then another one, who will scale up and produce your anticipated vaccine in commercial quantities? Will, will you do that in our own uh, manufacturing facility here or do you, do you anticipate? In the long term, not right away. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, it's still going to take a year before the ma um, manufacturing facility is up and running. So until then, we're partnering with other organizations in Canada who can manufacture the vaccine for us for, for our phase three trials and then also for commercial manufacturing. So if you had had the manufacturing facility up and running, how, how would that have affected the development of this vaccine? So we would have been already um, in clinical trials a long time ago, and we would have probably been in clinical trials in June rather than now, uh, because we could have started making the vaccine um, in our, like manufacturing it in our own facility um, as early as February rather than starting the work in July. So I, I understand that um uh, we c we lost the ability to do that in Canada sometime in the late like 2007 2008 that we used to be able to do that and then uh, uh, we lost that ability and we've been without it ever since is that correct? There are small facilities, but but right now everybody wants to use them and and they are you know they're also working on therapeutics and and antivirals and so on. So we don't have enough of them in Canada. That's really what how it looks right now. So this manufacturing ma facility could be a big uh, boost to yes. Canada. Like, could yes. you say there's another outbreak? Could you make enough to um, treat most Canadians or many Canadians? Yeah, so of our own vaccine, our facility could probably make in the range of 20 million doses a year, maybe even more than that. Um, and for, for some, like, you know, it was really conceptualized as a facility to produce clinical grade material so that you can quickly get into these clinical trials. So that was the biggest holdup for us that we had to get people to manufacture this clinical grade material. Part of it was done in Canada, part of it was done in France, and so it takes time. If we had it all in house, we could have been much faster, like I said, we could have been in clinical trials in June. So that's really the, the niche for this facility to, to be a pilot scale that, that can produce this clinical grade material for clinical trials. Now, in, in cases of emergencies and pandemics, it can also help vaccines, make vaccines for, for those for the future. And so our facility for our own vaccine, like I said, could make between 20 to maybe even 40 million doses a year. Okay. 
So, uh, Dr. Gertz, is there anything that you want to say that I haven't asked you? I've asked no. you a lot of questions, but have you got everything out that needs to come out? <coughs> no. So I think this is a, a great. I, I'd like to thank you and uh, the committee for all the work you're doing um, for the organization and for the university. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important to have a committee like yours um, in existence and, and be there for the community. And I think it's important to thank everybody who is interested in this and uh, thank them for their attention. Well, I know tonight in particular, I mean, there's many different groups, scientists, individuals, but also a group from the hospitality watching the, the hospitality industry watching this very closely because um, I have chatted with some of them and you can tell this is, has very real implications for people, for jobs, for for careers, for yeah. uh, livelihoods, you know. We need a, we need a solution for it. and. Everybody's tight. We need to get back to our normal lives. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're all very grateful that it's here in Saskatoon, that we're doing world-class science right here, and that we're developing a world-class solution to a world problem. So uh, thank you so much, and thank, thank you, you for your t to your team. And uh, um, I would say to uh, if people are interested more in uh, Vito Intervac, we do have our own web page, and you can uh, email us. And it as at um, our web page is uh, intervacclc.ca, and um, you can contact us at uh, intervacclc at usas.ca if there are further questions. Well, we tried to uh, put together a number of your questions today to answer them, but I think we're uh, I think we got most of them. So thank you very much, and look forward to. Uh, uh, a quick solution to a very terrible problem. Thanks so much.